Hi, I'm Dr. Dominic King, sports medicine physician at the Cleveland Clinic, and we're going to talk about the post-procedure rehabilitation and recovery protocols that follow a gluteal and hamstring minimally invasive tenotomy. The rehabilitation and recovery uh, is broken down into a couple of different phases. We'll start with gluteal tendinopathy and then talk about hamstring. Uh, some of them share some similarities, but there are uh, some differences that are important to note and will help your patients recover, cut down on the number of calls you may be getting back from patients uh, within the first few weeks uh, after the procedure, and also set yourself and patients up for success. So the first phase is the protective phase. So this is the first two weeks after gluteal tendinopathy. Uh, the same day of the procedure, uh, I don't have much concern for patients um, uh, walking immediately. So uh, it, they might be some non-weight bearing for the first hour or helping to get to the car just because they don't know really what they might be feeling. And with being anesthetized, they might feel really good uh, and they haven't felt that way for, for a while. So uh, the, the only time that I might have them, uh, you know, get in a, a wheelchair to a car, uh, maybe immediately after the procedure, but right after that, they're able to have full weight bearing uh, as they get home and navigate uh, stairs. Um, remember, it's more work for them to hike their hip in the air on crutches than it would be for them to just walk around. So it's more work for the gluteal tendon. So, you know, put the gluteal tendon in a position of comfort, but maybe it'll be non-weight bearing just immediately after the procedure, but they're gonna get up and walking uh, very, very quickly. Um, I'd, I'd have some caution when uh, rising out of a seated position, you know, that, that's where you're really putting the gluteal tendon on tension and then trying to load it. Uh, many of these patients have significant gluteal atrophy. Um, and now that they have a tendon that actually can functionally work again, um, those muscles are going to want to get get going as the tendon wants to as well. And if you overload it too quick, you're, you're going to end up with a tendonitis and a bursitis. So we have them use the contralateral leg for pretty much dominant use, uh, although they should be concentrating as normal gait as possible. But when rising out of a seated position, uh, uh, on and off uh, at the uh, toilet, in and out of a, a chair, in and out of a car, they should put uh, a little bit more weight on that uh, contralateral leg. Um, caution with stair navigation. You know, uh, it's uh, using a cane, uh, if needed, spe specifically for descent, uh, should, should be considered. Uh, you know, the having an educational moment with a patient and talking to them about how to use a cane to get up and down stairs um, can save you here, right? Because um, going upstairs is easy enough. They just use their dominant leg, their contralateral leg, uh, and then bring the other one along. But coming down the, the stairs, uh, you know, having a cane that can bring down that leg that you just performed tangent on together with the cane so that they can lean into that um, has been helpful for quite a few patients because that's really a place where you're going to put a lot of stress across the gluteal tendon. Um, the nice thing is, and what we say, they can just leave the cane near the stairs. They know where it is. Wherever they, if they went up, they use it when they, they, they get up and they can leave it there. If they're only using it when they come uh, down, they grab it again uh, when, when they're headed back up. So they just know that it's left in one place. I don't have them navigate around with a cane any other place, but using stairs is a, a consideration. Phase two, when we get into the third week. So by the third week, uh, we I expect those patients maybe to still have some soreness of their lateral uh, hip. Uh, certainly, I don't know too many patients who are directly laying on it uh, in bed, uh, but now it's time for physical therapy, right? So two to one ratio of eccentric to concentric, partial weight tandem exercises to start, really starting with uh, with high reps, um, and then high volume uh, to stimulate metabolic activity. Um, we want to know uh, back from the physical therapist um, if the patient is consistently painful um, and, and may need a, an ultrasound in the office to take a look at if they have developed any significant hyperemia or swelling around the tendon, if they do have a little bit of a tendonitis. Remember, these are lower extremity weight-bearing joints. This is different than the type of therapy that you're just going to do with a tendon for a tennis elbow or calcific tendinopathy at the shoulder. So you need to have good uh, close communications with your PTs, at least the, those first couple of visits. Um, patients shouldn't be pain-free, but they should be uh, remaining below a three out of four out of 10. Uh, and then that pain should be able to return to baseline. We talk to patients and say, this is gonna be something that's gonna feel a little bit like a roller coaster. There's gonna be some days that you swear things are better uh, and you're getting better. And then something's gonna happen. You're gonna overdo it in therapy. You're gonna get out of a chair the wrong way and you're gonna swear you did anything. You didn't do anything to it, but you probably overloaded that tenant a bit. It's going to take a couple days and then you'll recover. And then week by week, you're going to see these changes. Um, same thing when we get to reloading. That's when we get to kind of the weeks seven through 12. We're really uh, loading up, progressing back to uh, 
uh, the repetitive type of educations, understanding load management, how much is too much and how to appropriately use that. Um, patients can expect to return back to work with repetitive usage by six weeks if they're doing uh, manual type of work. If it's somebody who's uh, gonna be uh, sitting in a chair, desk work, uh, they might not need to take any time off because they're pretty much doing exactly what they'd be doing at home uh, from the gluteal standpoint. Um, back to sport type of activities by about eight weeks, two months out. Uh, at that point, they've gotten through physical therapy. They've gotten, gotten through the isometric kind of easy uh, work and they've started to load it. So they should be getting back to uh, initiating the sports uh, specific activities then. Um, and it will tell patients, you know, give this three to four months before you fully pass judgment and can say, yeah, I'm really glad I had this procedure done. Um, they're going to feel improvements as they get towards that eight week mark, the six week mark. Uh, some patients certainly have come in and said, hey, this is all I needed. You know, four weeks out, I felt great. But I'd say the vast majority of people at eight weeks are saying, okay, I, I'm definitely better. And I know some things that still need to get better. And that's where we, we, we anticipate uh, and set those expectations for them of buy into this for 12 to 16 weeks. Uh, and if you uh, exceed that, wonderful. Uh, great. If, if exceed our expectations, get better in, in, in eight weeks, uh, but don't be frustrated if you're at that point because these are weight-bearing joints, different than an elbow that would still be painful at, at four months. Uh, for the hamstring tendon, similar but different. Um, so weeks one through three, uh, a knee scooter, especially if they're crutch naive. So if they don't know how to use crutches, um, getting them on a knee scooter is gonna be uh, helpful. Uh, a lot of these patients that we end up seeing, they've had this for a while. This tissue uh, has been pretty friable, it's irritated, um, and putting any significant tension on it can be painful, right? So a knee scooter can really help out some of the patients uh, as we've seen. Um, otherwise, I have them crutches non-weight bearing for the first week, um, and I'll have them start to partial weight bear as pain allows, kind of the second week, maybe the third week. Um, same recommendations about caution when rising out of a seated position, um, caution with uh, stair navigation. So I normally I'll have them use a cane. Um, so if they're using crutches, uh, they can kind of crutch over and either have somebody take it up uh, with them, or if they feel uh, good enough using crutches on stairs, but if they've never used them on stairs, crutch walking on stairs is actually a, a skill uh, that's difficult. So have a cane to get up and down uh, stairs so that you're not uh, overusing it. Uh, you know, you're not gonna feel really good sitting around, uh, turning around and sitting and trying to get up and scoot up on your butt. Uh, and it's not going to feel good trying to climb on your knees. So you do need to have a plan for this first couple of weeks uh, with uh, stair navigation uh, at home. Uh, in uh, If you can stay on one floor for maybe the first two weeks, it may be more beneficial. And I say this from personal experience of having patients who've called back in the first couple of weeks and saying, I overdid it on the stairs. Um, and so take, take, take that as you will. Um, four to seven weeks, you know, some patients will start physical therapy at three weeks, but uh, normally I just want, you know, pain-free range of motion, letting gravity kind of hold, hold the leg. But by the time they get to four weeks, they should be in physical therapy, um, getting into some isometrics, um, uh, and then slowly uh, getting to higher volume. Uh, same as we've said with the glute tendon. Um, let them know that they're gonna be sore. Uh, they're gonna be sore because it's a joint, it's a tendon that really never gets to relax. Every step you take, anything, any pivoting that you have on there, you're using that tendon. Uh, I, I relate this a lot to common flexor tendons of the elbow. Um, you can go through your whole day without really using too much of your common extensor tendon. But every time you grip, you grasp, you, you grab something, you're on a mouse, you're on a computer, you're on a phone, you're using your common flexor tendon. Um, this is the common flexor tendon of the hip, right? It's, it's always under tension, it's always being used, uh, especially after you get off the crutches. Um, and then this phase three, you know, starting at that eight to 16 weeks, um, uh, very similar to the, the gluteal tendon, um, but, you know, as you see more hamstring tendons and you do this procedure on more hamstrings, uh, the, it, it's going to be very similar. It's going to feel similar to common flexor tendons. You got to make sure to educate these people and make them aware of the fact that you're not going to feel better all, all along, but we wouldn't keep doing this procedure if we didn't see people get better. So uh, the, this is one of those that you have to set those expectations early because these, a lot of the hamstring patients, they're runners, they're active people. They're people who want to get back. Uh, they just went through this procedure. They've done some physical therapy. They want to test this out. If they test too much, too quick, they're going to get an ischial bursitis and they're going to be back in your office. Not that you can't take care of that, uh, but you can get in front of that by educating your patients. Uh, so again, a couple things with uh, the, to think about if you're thinking of visuals for hamstring tendons, the knee scooter uh, really can be a life saver some, for some patients, especially if they're crutch naive. Um, the different seating devices that have the ischial uh, 
tuberosities cut out so that they can just comfortably kind of nestle in there. I have, I've had a lot of patients pick these up and love these. Uh, so it's it's a significant uh, conversation that we have when we're teeing them up for uh, TenJet just for them to go get one of these uh, and see how they feel in it before the procedure and then feel how they feel in it uh, after the procedure uh, and then again the recommendation of when they're going up and down stairs if you're not if you don't have a physical therapist who's showing people crutch training and stair navigation simple concepts uh, around up with the good down with the bad um, and being able to use those those crutches or cane in the right way is important so some uh, takeaways, uh, we have a post minimally invasive tenotomy office visit follow-up evaluation at week eight. Uh, I put it at week eight because by that time, they've normally gotten through most of their physical therapy. They've done enough to start feeling if it feels good or if they've overdid it, it's, it ends up being a really nice time to kind of intervene and talk of whether or not we need to have them in the office. Uh, managing those expectations until uh, that follow-up, you know, four to six weeks before they may notice any significant results, three to four months before they forget about, you know, their, their elbow, their hip, their tension, whatever their body area is that they feel that discomfort. Um, and letting them know that they can be sore uh, for, for a while. Um, Weight-bearing structures, uh, they, they're putting a lot of weight through this. They're constantly using them. Um, when they're sitting in a chair, they're putting pressure on their hamstring tendon. When they're laying in bed, they're putting pressure on their gluteal tendon. Uh, this is different than the upper extremities, right? So you can tell them and expect you're going to be sore, but you're going to be a different kind of sore. And I want you to focus on this week by week, not day by day. Uh, working closely with the physical therapy group, especially in the first two to three weeks of physical therapy is going to be key to see if they're flaring up and if the patient just needs a little bit more uh, encouragement or uh, a little bit more early hand holding on, on the fact that they may be loading these tendons a little bit too quickly. Really have an in-tune conversation with your physical therapist about that. Um, if somebody's flared up at, at the eight-week mark, think about tossing that on and looking for some power Doppler in the fact that they might have been overloading these tendons. Um, and it's not abnormal to have somebody who may need a corticosteroid injection, peritendinous intraversal steroid injection at eight weeks if they're really flared up. Uh, you know, don't just consider that, oh, maybe they had a tear, uh, you know, knock on wood as I'm, I'm doing for my office here. Uh, we haven't had anybody who's had a rupture of their hamstring tendon or their gluteal tendons after these procedures. What they do is they feel good. They start to lay on it a little bit more. They're feeling like they're out of the woods. They start loading it more and the muscles can't tolerate it. The muscles had some atrophy in it. And now they have a bursitis uh, or, or a tendonitis that needs to be uh, dealt with. Use it as a means to an end, continue with the therapy, see where they are at, uh, at four months, uh, five months, and uh, you'll, you'll have a procedure that really you can approach a lot of patients who have significant gluteal tendinopathy, even some uh, gluteal tendons that are post uh, hip replacement, uh, lateral hip type of uh, pain uh, that's continued despite the, the replacement. Same thing with the hamstring, especially um, uh, after after surgery. Um, there's a lot of patients out there who need uh, help for this. And if you have a principled way to approach it and to rehab it, uh, you, you can end up having some pretty successful results and having some happy patients who can get back to doing what they love. So thank you very much.